Hello everyone and welcome back to the show. This is a quiet show today because Jesse is back from Timeless. Hi. <laughs> this is possibly the most hungover I've ever seen you. Yeah. And you had, how much did you drink? Uh, half a Guinness. Half a Guinness. Well done, mate. Yeah. Um, well, that was two nights ago. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So this is pretty much the effects of no Exhaustion. sleep and working too much. Yeah, literally no sleep. Oh, dude. It was six and a half hour drive up there. Oh. It was about five and a half hours on the way back. You should have borrowed the Jag. <laughs> and I think the most sleep I got was the first night. I think I got about four or five hours. <sighs> yeah. Was the event good? It was Actually, no, hold on, hold on. I'll rephrase that. Was the event good for all of the customers? Yeah, they... Flipping loved it. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. I'm not going to ask if it was good for you or Mag. Do you know what was really... Because... My favourite thing about it was that the there was a guy who has such an amazing personality, like big, bigger than life personality. He's called the Tourette's Gamer. Right. Um, because he has Tourette's. Yeah, good reason for the title. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's good because it then he doesn't have to explain it because obviously with his Tourette tics... And there's shouting and swearing and stuff and noises. If somebody and comes in and complains when that's the title of the show. Yeah, exactly. You can't can't complain with that. No. And I'll be honest, well, I've got a stream of friends and I used to live with someone, as you know, who had dicks. Yeah. So between all of them, I I don't really even notice it, to be honest. No. And like one of my friends was there and who was ticking because obviously social anxiety and stuff makes that sort of thing worse so their tics were more pronounced and and they were apologizing and i was not to even know they were happening most of the time because nice. i'm just so used to living with it so but yeah um but he on monday night did a stream yeah and during the stream, suddenly 20 people from Twitch turned up in his stream and said, go and read your emails. And he made partner during his stream on Monday night, which if you're not into the stream world, you don't know what that means. It's quite a big deal, basically. Yeah. Um, and what he'd been doing on his route to becoming partner was every time someone subscribed, he'd blown up a different color balloon. So his room just looked like a ball pit of balloons. Like, Amazing. Imagine a room, not quite as big as this living room, but literally filled from floor to ceiling with balloons. He couldn't move through it. There were times, because he had, his setup's amazing. He's got different camera angles around the room. Yeah. Um, and one of the camera angles, at one point, you just couldn't even see him. <laughs> and he was just like, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> this, this and then when he made partner, he then got an electric strimmer out and basically burst all the balloons. It took him about... <laughs> 10, 15 minutes was so funny because he was like, everybody was like, not near the monitor. Jeez. <laughs> he's got this really expensive he monitor. He just wiped out a camera. <laughs> yeah, and he's just going around the room, like streaming all these balloons. Amazing. And he was falling, and then there's balloons there, so he's falling over and it's a big, do not do this at home. <laughs> oh, I love that. I it, love that. It was so good. And then he was there and he was just so much fun and so much energy. And uh, yeah. So, so you're talking about so much fun, so much energy, and how are you feeling right now? No fun, no energy. No fun, no energy. <laughs> so we're gonna have we're gonna have a quiet show quiet for Jesse. Show today. Quiet show. This isn't a quiet show. No, it's not a quiet show because the show is <sighs> the interview is amazing. Is, uh, yeah. All right. So let's go on to the show. So we brought back Nathan McQueen. Um, the reason we brought him back is because I'm getting a lot of people owning small, medium-sized businesses that are panicking about debts and worrying about how to deal with them. So this is a fairly sensible show, okay? Mm. As sensible as me and Nathan can be. Yeah. Because he's still put. He's still a great personality. He's still a lovely person, but the subject he deals with is fairly serious. Yes. Um, again, thank you to Nathan for coming on. I know you don't get paid for this. You don't get anything out of it. Apart from a bit of recognition and people knowing what you're up to. But I think this is going to help a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you who watched his previous show, I felt like his previous show was very much about him, how he how he goes about business, as yeah. in a mentality and stuff, and who he is as a business person, which is really interesting. But this is completely this is, different. This is it? so much information in this. And I felt like it was 
almost like doing a show for if you had a Q&A panel after yeah. his first show. Yeah. This is where he answers all those questions that people have about this sort of thing. What What's involved? How I'm, scary really is it? Wanted, all those sorts of things. I wanted every listener to be able to go, we've got some ideas of how to deal with our debts. Yeah. And and how to deal with those creditors, those people that are taking too long, what to do next. Yeah. That's what I really wanted out of this. And Nathan knew that coming in. He yeah. knew that he was going to give away loads of secrets and how he does yeah, stuff. Yeah, you briefed him and everything. Yeah. It was very professional. Yeah. I was I don't know. shocked. I, was, I must have been tired. Um, <laughs> but it was, I warned him that's exactly what I wanted. And, and the fact that he said yes to it, uh, just a testament to him because he's just, he's come on and he's given away how he does his work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, right, I'll tell you what, let's go on to the show, yeah? Yeah. Ladies and gents, here's Nathan McQueen. Newton's Nuggets. Welcome back, everyone. Look, this is my favourite bit of the show. I know I'm biased on the show, and I know I'm biased on the people that I bring into this. But when I can bring somebody on who is honestly a really good buddy of mine, he kicks me up the arse to make sure I'm being productive whenever he can, and he checks up on me as well. I absolutely love this. Ladies and gents, this is Nathan McQueen of the McQueen Partnership. How are you, Nathan? I'm good, thanks, mate. How are you? I'm good. All the better for seeing your gorgeous face, obviously. Um, to anyone that's listening to this on audio, go and have a look on YouTube. He is gorgeous. It's kind of tough to sit next to him in the studio, to be honest. Um, Nathan, thanks for coming back on the show, mate. You know I appreciate it, but I've just had so many people, small and medium business owners, worrying about debts, worrying about invoices not getting paid, worrying about this, that, and the other. Do you know what? One of the things that I hate about business is the chasing of money when a good job has been done. So yeah. I apologise for asking you to come back on. I wanted to pick your brains a bit more. Is that okay? That's no problem, mate. It's always a pleasure to come on. Thank you. All right. We're going to ask you the first question that I ask everyone, just so everybody knows that it's our show and they are in the right place. Nathan, could you say who you are, what you do, and why people should listen to us two chatting for 20 minutes or 30 minutes? Yeah, so I'm Nathan McQueen. I'm from McQueen Partnership, and I've been doing debt recovery now for approximately 30 years. So there's not many situations I haven't come across. Uh, we provide credit control, outsource credit control, out terms of debt recovery, and insolvency collect out for in administrators. I've been involved in cases such as Woolworths, HMV, Comet, so some fairly big ticket cases. We've also helped people collect £50 pound in wages, so we, we've got a scale uh, and sizeability. Uh, we're a phone-based collection company because that's the best way to collect debt. Uh, we don't sit behind letters and emails, uh, and we pride ourselves on uh, regular reporting and updates for the clients so they're never lost on what's happening with their debts. Mate, I've, I, you know, right, I am really biased on this show. For this one, I am really biased. I have put you into friends' businesses, and I've put you into clients' businesses, and I've seen the results you've got for them. But it's really hard for me to explain to people how good you are and why I think you're good until they work with you. Yeah. And something you just mentioned there, you know, you keep people updated with what's going on. That's one of the things that my friends have been really grateful for. So it's not like they've passed you an invoice and you've just disappeared and they don't know anything until money appears. It's literally you are updating people with what's going on. So just for that bit, thanks a lot, dude. It's really, really helped people. Yeah, that's not a problem. I mean, it's, when it's people's cash flow. Uh, at the end of the day, they need to know when what's happening on their cases. There's no point passing it out to an external agency who then claim to be the experts, and then they're having to chase that agency for an update. That's not that's not how things work. It should be a case of as soon as we've got a positive outcome or we've made contact with a debtor, they should know what's happening and how we're progressing that matter. Right. Let's get a, let's get a horrible one out of the way first, because this is something that one of my mates was on the fence about before he actually contacted you after I gave him a swift kick up the backside, okay? What's it cost? So we work on a no-win, no-fee basis, um, and it's based nice. on size and age, so anywhere between 5 and 15%. If it's commercial, uh, we also do construction debt recovery, which is more specialist, and we've got a couple of quantity surveyors that do our debt recovery for us on those, and that can go up to 25% because, obviously, the complexities of construction. Mate, nice and simple. I like that. So it's anywhere between 5 and 25%, depending on circumstances and age of debt. Yeah, and that so, also includes, uh, we work with external solicitors as well. So it, our letter before action from a solicitor is also included in our cost. So at no point does a client incur any debt, um, additional debt, uh, without any form of approval. So if we need to go through to litigation, 
we've escalated to solicitors, they send the letter before action. If they don't engage, then we can look to litigate, but only with client approval. And they've always got full visibility of what it's going to cost them. Mate, perfect. Okay. So the reality is I could hand you a debt that I'm having trouble getting. And let's let's keep the numbers really easy. Say it's for a thousand pounds, okay? I can hand you that debt. And actually, I might gain back 950 quid of it. Whereas if I don't hand it to you, I get nothing. Yeah, I mean, you could actually receive more because we always apply the late payment and interest charges as well. So it may actually cover our cost. So we can put those late payments. See, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. So we always we always add those debts. If they're due and applicable, then we'll apply them and then uh, we'll we'll try to recover those balances as well. Okay, something you just said there, though, if they're due and applicable. So does that mean I must have put it in my terms and conditions before I did the invoice? No, it's a statutory, it's a statutory um, charge that we can apply. It's, it's been set. So it's, the Act's been around for a long time. So, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be in your terms and conditions. It's, it's a statute law. See, I didn't know that bit either. So if I've got this £1,000 debt that's been hanging over my head for a year, it's been stressing me out and winding me up. I could hand that to you, and because you know the law better than I do, you could put extra extra fees onto that yeah. that cover your costs. Yeah, definitely. So the the charges are applicable. So it's on size. So there's a forty, a seventy, or a hundred pound charge per invoice. So depending if that if that thousand pounds over ten invoices, then that pl- that charge is ten times. If it's a single invoice and it's one charge. But then you also are entitled to 8% above base rate um, from the due date. I'm sorry, 8% above base rate? Above base rate, yeah, from the due date. From the due date? Yeah. See, I'm learning things already. We're not even five minutes into the show. And so in that way, I mean, if we manage to recover those outstanding, but if we've managed to cover the penalty fees as well, by the time we take off our commission, there's a good chance that the client almost receives their full balance back so it might actually cover our costs yeah just on our one thousand pound invoice example okay and if you say like you said if that's over 10 invoices the lowest fees that i quickly worked out was at 40 quid per invoice so that's 400 quid fee there so that's turned it into a one thousand four hundred pound bill if you're only taking five percent of that what's that 70 quid i'm actually up on the invoice yeah 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 mate that's amazing how many right this is something else that annoys me. How many small to medium business owners are into business because they want to worry about accountancy and their bills and invoicing? Or do they prefer doing their job that they like doing? Yeah. They wouldn't know all of these rules, would they? No. I mean, and that's why we provide that outsource function and the cons- consultation function because business owners, like you said, they've gone into it because they're passionate about whatever they're producing, service or a product. And the rest yeah. of it is... You, they, they learn on their feet um, and you don't always get that right. I mean, outsourcing credit control and debt recovery is a skill. We, uh, this is all we do. So I'm not focused on building something or selling anything else. We don't only have a focus on debt recovery and credit control. So it's always a good, we're always a good source of uh, information or assistance when it comes to when it comes to the clients. And I'm always willing to pick up the phone. So if anyone wants to have a chat about these type of things and they don't know what they want to do, then it's it's a good it's a good uh, it's a good tool just to give us a call. Um, like Bob Waskins used to say, it's always good to talk. Mate, it's right. And do you mind us putting your phone number up on the notes of the show? Not a problem. Not a problem. Awesome. So if you're listening to this and you're worrying about how to get hold of Nathan, I know what Jesse's like. It will be in the notes of everywhere. It'll be in Spotify. It'll be on YouTube. It'll be on iTunes. Everywhere. Okay. We will make sure it's easy for you to get hold of him. If you're worried about talking to a debt collector for any reason message me or jesse and we'll do a three-way chat with you and introduce you to him it's not a problem yep. um something you mentioned quickly in there was that you do everything from start to finish that's interesting to me because we've only talked about you chasing an invoice that i've messed up on and i it, actually it might not be me messing up on but we'll carry on with a thousand pounds and i didn't chase it properly or i didn't keep on top of it what do you mean that you can do it from start to finish? Does that mean you suddenly take over my invoicing? We do, yeah. So the invoicing function itself is you do, um, but when it becomes – so we manage the credit control process. So we'll chase it. So we can do things like we can credit check 
debtors so that you're always aware of who you're dealing with and the risk you've got. And with giving credit, there is risk. So it's always good to know. We put we make sure that's regular as well. So a lot of credit control teams will do the initial credit control uh, report to see what the risk is. But then that might sit on there for a year, two years, five years. They've never gone back to it. And then the, the state of the world at the moment, things are changing all the time. People are getting CCJs, directors are leaving, et cetera. And all these type of things affect somebody's credit rate and could affect the eventuality of getting paid. So it's this case of staying on top of that process. So we do that for the clients. We white label the function. So to the outside world, if we are acting for ABC Plastics, to the outside world and their clients, their debtors, they're being dealt with by us, but they think they're still being dealt with by ABC Plastics. We set up dedicated emails, addresses, dedicated phone numbers. The debt, the, my collectors know how to talk to the debtors so that it's client relationship. So with, even with debt recovery, the process is it's a customer service process. We want to understand what the pinch point is, why the debt is not paying. So it's not, it's not an aggressive tool. So the biggest issue with people letting go of their credit control is the fact they feel that they're letting go of control of their customers, whereas yeah. actually it's not. We're a skilled team. We've done this for a number of years for some large organizations, and we've never lost a customer. Um, it's, and it's, it's all about the approach. We're a phone based, like I said, we're a phone based collection company. So it's all about the how we talk to debtors and it's everything's with, with respect. It's about treating the customers fairly. It's about the customer journey and ultimately getting the client paid. Mate, you, what you've hit on there is actually one of the reasons I put one of my buddies in front of you. He was getting so upset by chasing debts with one big customer that he thought he was starting to be seen as the bad person and the nasty person because he's just talking about money all the time. And he's like, but Paul, before this, we had a great relationship. And I said to him, look, that's why you want these guys involved because they can talk about money and you can just talk about future projects. Yep. Yep. And it was amazing, the change in him. You mentioned earlier when we were talking about chasing invoice, about the stress of chasing invoices. For him... And and I have to be careful to not say his name because I keep going really close to saying his name and that would be so wrong for you and for him. That's not fair. Um, for him, I know you took away a lot of the mental stress that he hated as part of his business. Yep. And you've released him to do what he loves doing again. So thinking on that, I can honestly see what you do as part of a mental health service because you're making business easier for people. Yeah, I mean, while people are focusing inwards in their businesses, if they're having to chase overdue accounts, that's taking a significant amount of time away from their day. And therefore, they're, having, they're either working extremely long hours or having to work weekends as well and add that into it. And then the pressure, of, I mean, not everybody is great at sales. Not everybody is great at marketing. Not everybody's great at picking up the phone and chasing debt, and people don't like it. We do see it all the time. Some in the debt recovery side of the business, and there's a large number of people out there that are frightened to chase their own invoices because they feel that they're going to upset the customer. Now, yes. ultimately, the balance is due, um, but we're here to take. So we take the emotion out of that that process because when it comes to debt recovery, um, if it's your product and your service and you've believed that you've provided the ultimate service and the ultimate product, and why aren't you getting paid? So it becomes an emotion, It become, and that, become, that can become an angry emotion. The debt may have a similar issue. They might have a dispute. They might think the product's not good or there's a service issue. So there's a clash of heads, and that's what happens. And then the emotion just escalates from there, and you get to a point of impasse. So passing it out to someone like McQueen allows – us to take that emotion away. We can then see both sides of the coin. We can understand what the issue is, work out what that pinch point is, and ultimately then resolve it to get a conclusion. Whether it's, we would always provide proper advice. So if we look at the situation and we believe actually the debt's never going to get paid and they've got a genuine reason for not paying, we will then ask, we will then pass that back to the client and advise them, this is why we believe this, this situation. And it helps de-escalate that situation. Because the last thing you want to do is back somebody into a corner and they've got one of two options, it's fight or flight. And yeah, so this and it only goes nuclear from there. So you don't want to get into a legal situation because if you end up in, in issuing county court action, 
even you incur costs and it still might be a dispute. So we are that yeah. process in the middle. So we try to understand what the issue is. So 40% of our clients are people that we've collected money from. That's, that's amazing. Because, I mean, ultimately, it's we try to understand why the debtor isn't paying. And it might be, and in a lot of situations, they might have been paid. So there's a knock-on effect. It's a, it's a spiral. If they're not being paid, it's causing them cash flow problems. They're then leaning on our clients for not, not to pay them. So they're acting, using them technically as a bank and an authorised overdraft. So they, and that way, if we can start to work with a payment plan or things like that, and then we can actually then work. Um, there's no, as long as there's no conflict, we can then start to work with the, uh, the debtor to actually help them get paid. And it's, a, it's just unnatural. It's like pulling on a piece of wool on a jumper. As you could ask, it's like everything starts to unravel and it, it goes further and further down the chain. And like I said, the fact that we continue to work for these people mean they've yeah. been approached fairly and they know they've been treated fairly um, and the situation has been resolved. Hey, that's got to be great. Uh, an amazing feeling for you. If you help two or three companies in a line who were struggling, who were having issues, and then you literally see the concertina of that one worked, that one worked, that one worked, that one worked. Yeah. All four clients are now really happy and turning around and going, wow, not only did we get our invoice paid, we got these extra fees and charges on top that we never knew about, and we got this covered and we got that covered, and we didn't do the work. Yeah, That's got to feel amazing. It is. And, it, and like I said, that's all we do. So it's like we're, we're not, we've got not, no other focus on anything, so we haven't got to worry about building a product or whatever. We've just literally got to collect the debt for somebody. Um, and we can have, like I said, we have that sensible conversation. And that's what it is. It's conversation. And it's educating the clients as well because we can actually – help the clients improve their process because the credit control process it should actually be proactive. It should actually be before it, the balance is due. It shouldn't be waiting until yeah. it's overdue to have that conversation. We should actually be talking to somebody to make sure, have they received the invoice? Have they received the goods? Is there any queries? Is there anything else I can get? Yeah. It's a customer services call. It's a sales call. So Do you know what? I was just thinking about it. And I was just I was just trying to think of an example, and I'm going to use Nuggets as an example. We used to have advertising on the show that people would pay a set fee and they'd get an advert on one show or on four shows. And I suppose the the argument here is, if I've invoiced them for those adverts and they haven't paid me, if they turn around to you and go, the adverts never happened, we didn't hear them. And you can then come to me and go, well, what days did you put the adverts on, out on and can you prove it? Yeah, I did, Nathan. I put them out on these days. There's the podcast that, you know, they're sat on Spotify and you can hear the advert on there. Yeah. All of a sudden, we've got proof positive that it went out as agreed and you can turn around and go, actually, you did do it. And we've got proof on Spotify, YouTube, all of these places that it definitely happened. Yeah. The flip side of that is that they come back and go, we don't think the advert happened. We didn't get to see it. We didn't get to hear it. You go, Paul, where's the advert? And I go, well, it's on these shows here. You go and have a listen and go, well, it didn't go out. I think there was a problem in the editing or there was a problem in the technology. It didn't work for some reason. Then we go, oh, no, what do we do? Obviously, they don't owe that invoice if yeah. we've proved that the work wasn't done. So, And, and then you've got all the grey zone in between. Maybe I did two out of four when I should have done four, things like that. Yeah. But all of a sudden, it's a conversation between me and you where you're now going, what's the best for the customer, Paul? It's then a conversation between you and that customer along the lines of, all right, I can see where you're going with this. I can see what's good and what's wrong. This is how we can sort it. Yep. Hey, I love that. I love that kind of attitude. Okay. And then you're dealing with the things by exception then. You're not de- so you're not doing every not chasing every single one of your customers. You're only dealing with the ones that we need some assistance with to resolve a query. So we've got Android customers, instead of having to on the phone all day chasing those Android customers, then you're actually only dealing with five that you might have a query on. So it, it makes it, it frees up time. Um, and it, like I said, it takes away the stress and emotion. Because a lot of these things, overdue invoices cost companies thousands and thousands every year. But one in time, two in obviously cash flow, and, and three is that it means then they can't pay their creditors. So it, yeah. really, it ruins relationships with their suppliers as well. So it's trying to to make that process as streamlined and, and as simple as possible so that customers are aware when their balances are due 
and what the what the action is if they and the consequences of not paying. Uh, so it's it's having that conversation. We we've, we've seen it with a lot of clients. They they're nervous one about chasing their debts, but then also talking to people before the balances are due. And that's just a skill set. It's an easy it's an easy call if you know how to approach that call. And like I said, it becomes a customer service call. It becomes a call where you just verify have you got the invoice? Have you got any product? Have you got a problem with the product? Or is there anything that any reason it's not going to be paid on the 30 days or whatever the terms are? And you've taken all that stress away by the time it comes round to that invoice falling due. And then if it is due and they still don't pay, then that's a different conversation because the fact you've already worked out there's no dispute. And there was nothing preventing that. Now it's just a non-payment situation. And you're not then waiting another 30, 60, 90 days on top to get that resolved. See, that's interesting. And you've just you just mentioned it's a skill set. It's a skill set that you and your guys need to have. Yeah. Are there right? I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second, okay? If somebody is listening to this and going, maybe I need that. I need that help. I need something going on here. What are the skills I'm looking for from a credit controller if I look anywhere else other than McQueen Partnership? What skills do I need to know they've got? They've got financial acumen, so you need to understand what they're looking at. They need to be able to read a set of accounts, read a credit report to actually assess that risk because that's ultimately that's where it starts, understanding the risk of dealing with that client. A lot of businesses don't do credit checking because they haven't got access to it or choose not to have access to it. They rely on yeah. personal relationships or I know him, I've known him for ages, but you don't know what's going on in their business. What you know, what you see is a front, you have no clue what's going on in the background. You've got to have collectors that are willing to pick up the phone. It sounds really basic, but that skill is dying. Too many people sit behind letters and emails. Now, emails are the worst because emails are read by the emotion that you're actually feeling at the time. So if you're in a bad mood, you've had an argument with your missus or whatever the reason being, you read that email in one way. If you're, on, you're having a good day, you read that email in a different way. When you're on the phone, which is the best collection tool, you can understand, you can hear whether they're paying or not paying. You can tell, you can get a gut feeling of being, whether they're being genuine. So it's, it's, that, it's that phone collection. So that's the, one of the biggest keys for a, a decent credit controller would be someone that's not frightened of the phone. And someone that's not frightened, like I said, being proactive. So rather than reactive and waiting to things to fall due, talk to them before it's fallen due. Have that, have that skill set. A customer services type of skill set, like I said, because the fact you're looking to resolve any issues before the balance becomes due. Don't wait until it becomes due and then have another 30, 60 days to actually resolve it because it's your cash that you're uh, that you're wasting um they have to be organized they have to know which debtors to contact and when now there's lots of different systems out there lots of different accounting packages that can help these things ours is a, a, a bespoke debt recovery system that we built ourselves and it manages our workflow so actually the collectors know exactly who they're calling on that day and why they're calling them so it gives them the last note the note that goes to the client so that they've got an update but it also prompts the collector to know what, why they're calling them. So it might be they've had a payment promise and that's in default. It might be the fact they've not been able to get through, so it reminds them they need to have a phone. So it's having a, a, an automated process that allows to manage that collector. I've seen over the years done many work for many different businesses that um, set up their credit control teams and helped revive their credit control teams as such. I've worked for I worked for one business that had. 6,000 customers and 10 collectors, um, and they were they were working off of paper statements. So that's how they were chasing the debt. Now, wow. great, but that's a lot of debtors for each collector, 600 debtors, and there's a good chance they're not getting through 600 calls in the month because there's other things that credit control team need to do. Um, so as a debtor, you'd want to be somewhere in that middle of that pile because you're not getting yeah. called. And there's, so there's better ways. So it's having a, a proper process and a proper procedure. And if you haven't got that process and procedure, then we can help set that process and procedure up and look at the look at what you've currently got and how to tweak it. I've, I've, I've we've had some horror stories. I, we did a, I did a, a really big steel ledger. It was thirty four million. One collector, and uh, they printed off six hundred pages of sage every week 
and flicked the sheets and randomly pulled out 10 sheets. And that's how, that's the people they were going to focus on that day or that week. Wow. And that way, they're missing, they're missing debts that should have been are overdue, well overdue. Um, and the process isn't there. And even worse, some businesses actually insure their debt as well. And insurance companies have got a particular procedure they want as well. So you may insure your ledger. You might have a debt that's on that ledger that's insured. But if you don't notify the insurance company in accordance to their terms, that debt's not insured. So you've paid a premium and you're not covered. So there's right. again, that, this. Just so everyone understands this, this is as simple as you can insure your car, but they won't check you've got an MOT on the car. Okay, if you drive that car without an MOT or it's got illegal tires or something like that, your insurance is forfeit. Yeah, exactly the same here. You've got to make sure you stick to the terms of that insurance. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then so the other couple of skills. I mean, you've got problem yeah. solving because the fact that not everything it won't always be straightforward. Um, this we see we're seeing a lot now because of certain accounting packages. It can actually make the collectors really lazy. Yeah. We see, yeah. So we do a lot of insolvency debt recovery as well. So we work for like the likes of Taneo and Interpath and people like that. Um, some of the big, the big four accountancy practices doing debt recovery when a company's gone into administration and the amount of poor records we see that then it prevent us from doing a proper job. So there's a lot of accountancy practices out there will allow you to put a debtor name in and an email address, and it automatically every every time you raise an invoice, it, it emails them. That's great. Yeah. But where are they trading from? Do you know who you're trading with? Have you got a proper trading name there? Do you know they're a limited company? Are they a partnership? Are they a sole trader? Do you actually know who you're acting for? Do some research. Have a look on companies' house. Validate who you are. Have a proper application form so that you actually know who you're dealing with. Capture all the data. Work address. Home address if it's a sole trader because, again, they're, they're personally liable. So know where they are. I mean, if the business closes down, contact them at their home address. But you need to capture that home address in the first place. You yeah. see too many businesses that actually just put in ABC plastics and that is what they put on their system. They don't know whether it's a limited company. They haven't checked, validated them. They've not looked, validate through VAT number, validate through companies' house registration number. So just gather as much information. The more you've got in your pocket, the easier it is to collect your debt. Because if it gets to litigation, they need all that information. It, it and it's, it's all very well having hindsight and saying all these things after something's happened. Yeah. But if they don't put these fairly simple things in place, like you said, if it comes to litigation, they're screwed. Yeah, I mean, you've got to know where you're enforcing it. I mean, you can't put a person's name or a business name on a, on a claim form without actually being able to serve that document. So there's no point saying, well, I've got the email address. That's not, that's not going to suffice. Yes, yeah. and, and it's 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 becoming an increasing problem because of some of these accounting packages allow collectors to be very lazy. Uh, and like I said, yeah. we see it a lot on the administration because when we pick up the records, we're like, um, all we can see is the name of the business, like, and that's okay if it's a limited company because we can find the rest. But if it's an individual you're dealing with, if it's a service you're providing, you might be I don't know a business consultant or do something like that, and you're providing coaching for somebody. If all you've got is their name. There's no point just having Paul Newton and then not knowing actually where, who they are. And yes, you correspond to them by email, but all right now they're not engaging with you and they're not responding to that email address. What do you do? You haven't got any, you haven't got no cl a clue where you're going to issue that litigation with. So just have, so data capture and is is key. So if that's critical, it ties back into that credit risk at the beginning, knowing who your customer is, knowing where your risk is, because the more you've got in your back pocket, the better chances are of getting paid and your reduction in actually that becoming a bad debt. So it's, it's all about due diligence. And it's, and it's, and again, it's, it takes time, which is why we offer that service to clients because they don't want to do that bit. They want to, they're all happy. They're, ma they're making a sale, right? I'm selling my product. I'm doing really well with selling product, right? But know who you're selling it to. And if you don't want to do it, let us do it because we'll take all that pain away. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm sorry, mate, but I think the fees that you charge for taking away so much pain, so much mental stress, so much anxiety, so taking away a job that most people don't get into business to do. Yeah, 
And and that's, that goes back into another one of the skills of collective need is, is resilience. I mean, you're dealing with humans and yeah. not everybody is having a good day when you're talking to them. And you might be catching a death on a bad day. And we get shouted at quite a lot. I mean, but I have got a thick skin. Um, so and I don't think there's many things I haven't been called over the years. But, so, but these things happen. It's not personal. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's used to prompt a reaction because that's what they want. They want a rise. And if you don't rise to that, that thing, it de-escalates quite quickly because then you realize, they realise that they're not going to get you to bite. You're still dealing. It's factual. You keep it simple, but you've got to have that resilience. You can't take anything personal when it comes to chasing debt because people will use everything to try and rile you, if they're, if, especially if they're not wanting to pay or they're wanting to delay payment for whatever reason. So it's just managing that and having that skin. And like I said, if you don't like that, then that's why we do, because we, we've, we've done it. We, the collectors, we can recruit are specifically trained to be able to deal with that. Um, and that's a mental And you experience. don't have, you do not have the emotional attachment to that thousand pound invoice that I do. Because that thousand pound invoice to me might be the difference of me paying my mortgage or buying my family's food that week. Yeah. Whereas to you, it's a professional service. Yeah. And and if something's an emotional to me, then when that person says, I'm not paying you because I, I thought the card trick wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, I'm going to get annoyed because I knew the audience loved it. Yeah. But you're going to go, actually, we can prove that he did. We can prove that it was delivered. We can prove that service was done. Yeah. There's no emotion from you on Yeah. No, I mean, obviously we're empath- we empathetic with everybody. So we make sure, like I said, that we want everyone to get treated fairly. We listen to the situation because that's what that's what you should be doing. As a decent collector, yeah. you listen. Because there is normally a pinch point, especially when, on a debt recovery side specifically. If it's get, it's getting to the point that they're not paying on terms, it could be the fact that it's cash flow for them, it could be the fact that they've got other issues that are causing them problems. So we try to work with them. We, we try to understand whether it's can't pay or won't pay. I mean, can't pay, then we can, what, we can work with them. We can maybe arrange them to have advice on how to get sorted. It might be the fact that they've got cash flow issues themselves. They've got overdue debts themselves. And if it's won't pay, then we've got a particular set of skills that make us a nightmare for people like that. We, we're like a dog with a bone. If we know we've got the situation and they're just being they're just ignoring us for no other reason, then that's there's, there's only one particular process that could be used for that. And I'd say it as well for the client, for the debtors, where anyone's listening to this, if you do receive debt collection or credit control letters, it's better to pick up the phone to somebody and have that conversation because yeah. ignoring us, just it's, it's, we don't go away. It's, it's not going away. It's not like, oh, I feel burying my head in the sand. This, this, will, this was going to go away. We're not. It's only going to escalate and the only person and then the additional costs come into it and things like that. So your debt can your, your debt can spiral quite quickly. I mean, look at the late payment charges. I mean, if you follow those late payment charges, then your debt can double, sometimes triple if you're not applying. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's to have those sensible conversations both ways, debts are credit. Mate, I think you've you've done a beautiful job. Thank you so much for coming on. I am going to ask you one question that I always ask at the end of the show, which is What's the one nugget of information that you want to give to everyone that's listening or watching this show today? Know your customer. The, the, nice. The economy is changing and people are struggling. So those that you think you traded with for years may be having issues. Think of all the things that happened during COVID, the loans that were given and things like that. People may be struggling to repay those now because they're obviously due now and and that may be impacting on what was a very successful business, may be causing them cash flow issues. So the customer that you're dealing with today might not be the same customer you were dealing with a week ago, a year ago, six months ago. So just know your customer and make sure, make sure you capture all the information you need on that business because that's what's going to make you get that's going to get you paid. Or a better right. chance of getting paid. That is spot on. Nathan, I know you're a busy boy. I know how important your time is to you. Thanks again for taking time out just to help a bunch of people that you may never meet them, you may never talk to them, but I know you've massively helped a load of business owners, mate. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much.
Right, ladies and gents, we're now going to go back to the bit where me and Jesse are talking about Nathan behind his back, and he won't know what we say about him unless he listens to the show. So I'll see you in the studio. Newton's Nuggets. So there you go, that was Nathan McQueen. Right, we went through so much. I mean, went through the assets and the needs for a decent debt collector. Went through how to deal with debts, how to talk to people, how to how to engage with people who owe you money while you still want to have a good working relationship with them. And actually, that's something that I really want to bring up. Okay, mm. the beauty of getting somebody in like Nathan, other businesses are available. Just don't go to them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, just use Nathan. Go yeah, use Nathan. It. Why not? He's helped us. Um, the beauty of using somebody like that is that they can look after the money side. Yeah, They can be the, we need this paid now, otherwise mm -hmm. we're going to have to do this, this, and this. Well, you can keep a really nice working relationship with the people that buy from you. Yeah, I think that's massive. It's funny. Uh, a lot of people don't realise this. A lot of people think that they need the personal touch. They need to be doing everything themselves. Yeah. And I'll give an example. When I... And you know this because I use you often. But when I'm yeah, photographing do. a an event, yeah, like a wedding or something, yeah, doing group shots means rounding people up. Oh yeah. And what I do is organise before the wedding normally people who are loud, who know people, who all the people are, most of the people, so they can go and shout at them. Because the worst thing I need is to be the person shouting at them because they already don't want to like me because I'm the photographer. Yeah. And it means that I'm not the person shouting at them to get stuff done. And they're annoyed, actually. It's somebody who they know, maybe respect or, you know, at least will do what they're saying because they know it's on behalf of the couple. And if you've got somebody like me who gets away with being a bit of a cheeky chappy yeah. and having a lot of messing about... I had one a while back. You were not the photographer, a different photographer. Yeah. Um, having trouble getting people for the big group shot. And there were these two ladies that were going, well, I'm not walking across the grass. Yeah. And it was like, well, that's the only way there. <laughs> so what the... And it was so fun. They started moaning. And I went, ladies and gents, apologies. This is all going to take forever because these two don't want to walk across the grass. Does anyone have a way to levitate them? Does <laughs> anyone have a way? Could, I know I'm the magician, but if anyone has a, and it was so funny, they were, they were shamed into, yeah, getting off their backsides and moving to where the bride and groom yeah. wanted them. But could anyone else have got away with that? No, not really. But you're there short periods of time, so it doesn't yeah. matter if they're a bit annoyed at you, really. No, them being a bit upset with me, yeah, has less importance to me than the bride and groom getting what they want. Yeah, absolutely. But so, then if I'm there trying to take natural photographs of them for the rest of the day yeah. and they just keep scowling at me, it's a bit difficult. This is it. <laughs> me taking that yeah. brunt for you and for the bride and groom, Yeah, I have no problem with that. Um, and, and to be honest with you, it kind of amuses me. Yeah. So, so why not? Because I've had it before where someone said, oh, you just need to take charge and shout at people. And, um, <sighs> you know, they were a rugby lad. And I was like, I've got this. It's under control. Yeah. And later, because there are a couple of points where I do shout at people to get do what I want, like the big group shot, and then they were surprised because I was suddenly shouting at everyone, and they were realised. Um, but it's all about managing those things, and it's the same thing with this, with that, for me, yeah. is actually you can still keep that nice, friendly relationship with someone because the people who are dealing with the finances are the people dealing with the finances, not you. Not the people dealing with the buying. Yeah. Not yep. the, and so even if you're dealing with one-man bands, your finance department, is, which is what Nathan's talking about, essentially becoming, Yeah. you know, they your credit control department are dealing with that with your customer. So you have the positive relationship. And if you as you, as you and I both know, if you work in a big company, that's how it works anyway. Yeah. And I might, and it's great because even if, and I, I know Nathan has a really good way of going about doing things and he smooths things over, but if you pick someone who doesn't necessarily do such a good job of that yeah, and annoys the customer, if you then have a separate relationship with them, they can come to you and go, oh, can you have a word? They're being He's a being bit bullish. Idiot. Yeah. 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 You could, you've got that relationship. And I've had that in a big business where I was the salesperson. I had a relationship and I had a phone call going, can you have a word with your account department? 
And I went, well, have you paid? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, yeah. have you paid the bills? Yeah. And then we had a and we had a sensible chat about it and he explained it to me and then I said, right, let's sort something out. And that can be your role. You're the, the person solving problems, being the good guy. Yeah. And without being obnoxious or nasty or anything, Nathan's quite happy to be the bad guy. In and sometimes comments. it amazes me how the payment for a whole invoice or statement could be stopped. Yeah. And it's over a dispute on 5% of the total value. Yeah. And then you go, well, hold on. What about if we paid the 95% while that dispute's going on? Are you happy to pay that? And they go, yeah, we're happy with that because we'll keep that on hold. Mm. Right, and well, let's do that. And then, you know, the accounts department go... Yeah, we're we're happy with that because we got ninety five percent of the money in, and we'll then prove the other five percent. Okay, yeah. and and it amazes me how those conversations don't happen. And also, one thing you've people generally are really bad at. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not great with the people skills, but I'm quite good at this bit, which is why I see how bad other people are all the time. Is people are really really tuned in to seeing only their side of things. Yeah. And what you need is often is that mediator to to see both sides and come up with it. And like you say, if it's only a five percent of it that you're arguing with, yeah, then actually you get not, you, you could probably come to an agreement over the five percent and the ninety five percent get paid in full. You're probably yeah. a lot happier. And so, and a prime example of this, I was working in a team recently, and a customer basically said something, and the the head of the team was basically like, oh, they're taking the mic, blah, blah, blah. And I went, I 100% agree with you. Bear with me one second. And I just stood up, walked around the other side of the table, sat down and I went, I'm recommending that you should be pushing them even more. And they went, what you say? Why are you talking to the empty chair? And I was just like, oh, I'm just talking on behalf of the customer. And they were like, what? And I was just like, well, I 100% agree with you as part of your team that they're taking the mic. But if I was on the customer side, yeah, I'd be telling them that they should at least be asking. Yeah. And they we basically then gave them a nice response back going, here's why, no. And they went, cool, I just thought I'd ask. And we were like, oh, it wasn't even and like move a... Move on. <laughs> yeah. Especially when everything's done in written word. It's yeah. so hard That's to take the emotion correctly. Yeah. Um, sorry, right. We, I know we go off on tangents. I know we do. Us? Never. <laughs> tangents. Um, d- guys, d- anything else you want to say on the show? Actually, the costs. When Nathan mentioned the costs to me, I <laughs> thought it would be a lot higher. It's interesting because the reality is if it gets worse and it gets to the state where it goes to court, yeah. you actually might end up with more money than you were due in the first place. It's nuts, isn't it? <laughs> And, I was like, how did that happen? And realistically, right, if if I get to the point of I'm going to start adding on those charges, yeah, and then that customer it sets a thousand pound invoice, okay? yeah, and then that customer goes, well, here's the thousand pounds, and I'm not paying you the extras, mm. even if I lost twenty percent of that, yeah, I'd still be going it's eight hundred quid that I was going to get nothing of, yeah, I'm still good with that, to yeah. be honest with you, hundred percent. I just I, honestly, I thought it'd be harder. I, thought I think worse. people automatically assume it's going to cost them thousands to get someone involved with that. Yeah. And actually, it may not even cost you anything. Yeah. D- knowing all of those so it's, rules. So it's and- worth ha- picking up the phone and just asking what the situation is, isn't it, at the end of the day? Yeah. Make that inquiry. Well, this is it. Just a conversation with Nathan or one of his team could turn into, you do know that legally you're allowed to ask for this, 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 and yeah. this. No, I didn't. No. Right. Are, are we done? Yes. Happy? Yes. Um, d- ladies and gents, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for commenting. If this helped you at all, let us know, okay? Because that kind of stuff keeps me and Jesse on the ball and wanting to do more. Yeah. Is that fair? Yes. <clears throat> ladies and gents, hit the share button, hit the like button, wherever you're at. I think that's it. That's it for this week's very tired episode of... Newton's Nuggets.
Hello everybody, right, you're on the YouTube page. This is what we want you to do. The first and the most important one is subscribe. It should be just up there. Then if you want to see more Newton's Nugget stuff, it's down there at that one. If you want to see things about the business speaking, hopefully that's up there. And then last but not least, the mental theft stuff we're working on down the bottom there. Go, subscribe. That's the big important one. And you know, share it as well. Why not?